So, um, good afternoon, and um, I'd like to um, start with uh, a quote from Philip Roth. It's maybe, it's one of his most well-known quotes, but still kind of, I think, worth mentioning. So, um, it's from American Pastoral. And Roth writes that you get people wrong before you meet them while you're anticipating meet them, meeting them. You get them wrong while you're with them. And then you go home to tell somebody else about the meeting, and you get them wrong again. Since the same generally goes for them with you, the whole thing is really a dazzling illusion. The fact remains that getting people right is not what living is all about anyway. It's getting them wrong that is living. Getting them wrong and wrong and wrong, and then on careful reconsideration, getting them wrong again. <laughs> That's how we know we're alive. We're wrong. <laughs> Maybe the best thing would be to uh, forget being right or wrong about people and just go along for the ride. But if you can do that, well, lucky you. So it seems to me that the two esteemed colleagues that are joining us today have been spending so much time with Philip Roth and Primo Levi that they both probably do get them right. So, well, to some extent at least. So, but yet both of them belong to what uh, Roth calls the people that listen. And the conversation today will be an opportunity for us to see their dialogical thinking and to witness how they make sense of a life of another. So um, thank you, Steve and Uri, for joining us and for letting us um, go for the ride with you or go along for the ride with you. I'm Verit Karti Shentov, most of you know me, and I teach and write on Hebrew and comparative literature at Stanford. I have been working with Uli and Steve for, um, as close colleagues for 20 years or so, and um, this moment of bringing them into conversation is something that I was really looking forward to. Um, not only because these are two great minds in the study of Jewish texts today, but also because there was no doubt in my mind that a conversation with, between them will open kind of new spaces for a discussion of um, the connections between literature and, uh, and history uh, and between um, life and texts. So for me also, this event today is a way to bring Philip Roth back from Europe after his uh, interview with Primo Levi in 1985 and 1986 and to continue the conversation here in America, to reflect on it from here, uh, and to do it in 2023. So again, I'm really looking forward also to, to hearing what you have to say about that. I want to thank the director of the Taubi Center, Professor Charlotte Elisheva von Robert, the executive director, Shayna Judith Hammerman, and Eva Clem, who is in charge of our events and finances. This would not have happened without you. So thank you so much. Uh, Uri Cohen is a professor of literature at Tel Aviv University. He's specializing in Hebrew and Italian literature. He is currently at Stanford as a fellow of the Stanford Humanity Center. So we're also grateful to the Humanity Center for making this possible. Before accepting the job in Tel Aviv, Cohen was a literature professor at Columbia University in New York. Uh, he is uh, the author of several books, and um, I'll name a few, Survival, Sense of Death Between the uh, World Wars in Italy and Palestine, How to Read Orly Castel Bloom, and The Security Style, a, a Comprehensive Study of uh, the Hebrew Culture of War. He's currently working on a counterbiography, a study in two volumes of Primo Levi. And really, he's doing also many other things, but I'm only mentioning what I think is relevant for our conversation today. Um, 
Stephen uh, Zipperstein is the Daniel Koshland Professor in Jewish uh, Culture and History, and he teaches here at Stanford. So you know, on sabbatical this quarter, but back next year, right? The sabbatical is feeling really good. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll have a chance to study with him, I hope, if you didn't already. For 16 years, he was the director of the Taube Center for Jewish Studies. He is the author and editor of nine books, including The Jews of Odessa, A Cultural History, Elusive Prophet, Echad Ha'am, and The Origins of Zionism, Imagining Russian Jewry, Rosenfeld's Lives, Fame, Oblivion, and the Furies of Writing, and Pogrom, Kishinev, and the Tilt of History. And these are all, um, were really recognized and, award, and received awards, and maybe I'll just um, mention here uh, that po Pogrom got, was chosen as the book of the year by The Economist, Haaretz, and Mosaic magazine. He is currently at work on a biography of Philip Roth uh, for Yale's Jewish Lives, a series which he uh, is editing together with Anita Shapira. Uh, Zipperstein contributions to the field have been recognized by the, by the Levian Prize of the Modern Language Association, the uh, Judah Magnus Gold, Gold Medal of the American Friends of the Hebrew University, and the Coret Prize of Outstanding Contribution to the American Jewish Community. I really, I mean, I have, don't have enough time to talk about um, um, Steve's contribution to Jewish studies here at Stanford and uh, I mean, it's, it's, the it's, world, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting enough to get out of my pajamas and to actually <laughs> and to actually be in public with other people who are fully clothed. And so, yeah, you. you, you but you uh, but I, I hope <laughs> yeah. that just a little bit, a few kind of uh, a little bit of information about these two amazing scholars uh, got you excited to hear what they have to say and um, help me welcome them, please, to, to our class. And to the okay, so I, I'll, uh, we've uh, discussed this before, so I'll start and I'll say that in the, in the sort of on the table is in this discussion about two authors who are very different and we have different approaches, well, perhaps should have different approaches to what the biography means within their uh, works. We have this uh, interesting, interesting moment where they both meet towards the end of Levy's life, and that is sort of uh, in the midst of our conversation. It is a, it is a really particular <coughs> meeting because I'm just going to read it a little bit because I wrote this down. It's not common that two writers meet in the fullness of life and art. Uh, Philip Roth had an intense interest in the Holocaust, and perhaps later we'll talk about what exactly it means for him. And it, I think, from what I've seen so far, that it forms a crucial mirror to his protected childhood. To be, to be able to see it as such as having been spared the 20th century. I'm quoting, broad, I'm quoting a bunch of stuff that appears all over. Uh, uh, Primo Levi had not been spared the 20th century. He carried its sign incised, uh, incised in the flesh. He was, uh, of course, at Auschwitz and wrote about it, an extraordinary body of work which makes him the subject of uh, my study. In April 1986, a year before Levi's death, uh, Roth was in London and went to hear him give a talk at the Italian Institute. They immediately, now I use the word clicked, but uh, it's not scholarly. Uh, so I, I'm using the word Roth uses, which is they unlocked. It's such an interesting word to use for that. Like, you know, they, they sort of they immediately, they recognize. The, the fantastic thing here is that they recognized each other. They, whatever, we've, we've, yeah, whoa, this is a discussion we've been having. What did they see in each other? It's such an interesting question. But they obviously recognized, uh, uh, they okay, obviously recognized something in the other, which uh, we can talk about. Uh, his friend, the Italian friend that got them together, remembers commenting, now I am not sure about this, but remembers, I remembers Roth commenting that Levy was wonderful and a holy man. 
that's the Italian journalist that put them together. That's what she remembers. Yeah. Nobody has uh, seconded that. He remembers Levy, this is Roth, telling him, you know, this has all come too late. Of course, uh, um, in September that year, Roth and his wife, Claire Bloom, came to Turin. They spent uh, four days, I think, together. Uh, but they were speaking. They didn't write down the interview. The interview was reworked uh, in writing, which I think is very visible when, you, when uh, uh, you read it. And it appeared in the New York Times. For Primo Levi, and here I'm talking from his point of view, this was a pivotal moment as a, as, a world, as a global author. This is the moment he truly got introduced to American audiences with that kind of authority that Roth had to introduce somebody uh, like that. And I suffice it to say that besides Dante, Primo Levi is the only Italian author to have had all of his works translated into English. Mm. Everything. Mm. It's, uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, little detail. Um, for what it was for Roth, I don't know, for Levi, this meeting was access to a world which was much larger than his own with the one he operated with in, within, published within. For him, in a certain sense, it was arriving, if, you're, if that was the. And from a certain perspective, just an initial one for Roth, Levy was one of many people he met and many great writers he promoted, which he did, I think, generously, if, generously, if I uh, uh, remember correctly. And perhaps this is a good way to start. I don't know if you want to start with other remarks. Uh, please. Um, thank you. Um, you know, there, there's something intrinsically intrusive about all biography. And, um, and one has to be aware of it when one writes it. And I, I've written several, and, um, and I've always been interested, even I've integrated uh, biography into my other books, too, that aren't strictly biography. And, uh, and I could speak later about the reason why I actually shifted from focusing on the Kishinev pogrom to, to, to Roth, if, if any of you are interested. Um, I, uh, I when in 11th or 12th grade, I grew up as a, in a very fundamentalist Orthodox home. Um, went to uh, dreadful schools of the sort that you've read about in the New York Times, uh, where everything that was in Talmud was called English. Um, pages uh, about evolution were torn out of our biology books. But my father um, was a kind of book collector. We had some 30,000 books in the back of our house in a building. That's where I actually read, whacking off, one of the chapters that went into um, Port Norris complaint in Partisan Review before I left for the Chicago Yeshiva, uh, talk about whip, whiplash. But I had, a, I had a teacher in 11th or 12th grade, Mrs. Wilson, who I recently learned went to Stanford, who um, I, I was, uh, she was a divorcee. She lived on the wrong side. I'm putting in quotation marks so that you don't um, criticize me. Uh, the wrong side of, of Los, Los Angeles. She had bookshelves made of wood. She was, I, I fell in love with her. And, um, and, uh, and I remember once she told me, she said, um, you, you, don't, you don't actually understand people. And, um, and I, I took that very seriously and actually worked at actually taking in people the way in which one might learn a discretionary language like Finnish and, um, and, and worked at it. And then I think that was one of my inspirations actually for writing, writing biography and being preoccupied with biography, trying to make up for a kind of what in Hebrew is a mum, a kind of wound, uh, a shortcoming that I, I think Mrs. Mrs. Wilson um, was correct in diagnosing. Um, so th there's something presumptuous about biography in general, there's something utterly presumptuous about writing about someone like Roth, who has written, writes his entire life about himself and yet doesn't. Uh, someone like Roth, who is deeply skeptical of the efficacy, the possibility of biography, as uh, Verit indicated from that quoted American pastoral. And then writing about someone who writes as well as Roth is an enormous challenge that causes intermittent insomnia. Um, and um, having said that, 
Um, um, and, and, and also you want to bear in mind, I'm sure all of us have been in rooms like this where we're with family or, or friends and then you walk out of the room and everyone in the room talks about what happened to the room differently. So what does it mean then to actually write about someone? I, I knew Roth toward the end of his life, but he knew I was writing his biography and so uh, did I know Roth? I don't know that I did. And uh, what does it mean to actually write about something? And one, confronts this when writing history in general, where you're not in the room and you're, and you're constructing um, um, all that you're doing from archives, and all archives are really are, are the papers that fell onto the floor. Um, there's numerous papers that, numerous material, all kinds of material that life generates. You have ostensibly archives, which are just the papers that still exist, and they're in files someplace, and no matter how many you've seen, you, you couldn't have exhausted them all. And in addition to Roth, there was this other biography that was canceled within a week of its publication, written by someone um, who was accused uh, um, this has been recorded, right? Um, who's been accused of, of very serious sexual crimes, and the book was canceled, um, um, an incident uh, unlike any other in recent American literary um, um, life. Um, and so the, um, uh, the, the, the task in some ways is counterintuitive, and what you end up doing, and I'll explain why I'm listing all of these difficulties in a moment, what you end up doing is trying to collect as much as you possibly can, and what time allows, uh, about every particular crucial incident. And then you rub these details against one another, and eventually you formulate, because, I mean, all writing, all writing in the end is, is you, always you're walking a midway point between writer's block, which means that you can't formulate, and writing too quickly, which means that what you've done lacks texture. And all of our life as humanists is spent walking some sort of middle line where you don't want to suffer from writer's block because that, that finishes you and you don't want to write something without texture, well, because that finishes you. <laughs> and, so, and so you're constantly, is it possible to turn down the heat? Is it, if that, thanks a lot, Shana. Um, I, I'm just heating myself up. So, um, so with regard to the, the moment that Philip, that Roth meets, um, Primo Levi, it's a moment where he's actually in the midst of, uh, of a crisis, uh, a crisis of confidence. And um, now I, I know this it, because of various documents that I've found. I found the, um, the drafts that he wrote to the writing of Sabbath's Theater, where he actually reflects on the four or five books that came before Sabbath's Theater published in 1993 or 94. And, um, and where he actually, no, Operation Shylock, I'm sorry, published in 1993, and where he actually speaks about all of his books starting from Counterlife that he publishes just around the time he meets Bruno Levy as really um, efforts at nonfiction. Now, technically, they're, they're, they're novels, but he's beginning to despair of fiction. He begins to despair of, of, of how fiction actually leaves you um, um, rem at a remove from life. And he actually wants to actually come closer, well, to life. And, um, and eventually he'll write his memoirs, the facts. He'll, um, he'll, he writes the counter life, which is a exploration of, of some ways in which he might be living differently than the way he lives. He writes a book um, um, uh, about his father, Patrimony. Um, and he writes Operation Shylock, where there are not only, there's not only one uh, Roth, um, often called a writer of narcissism, but two Roths um, um, wrestling with one another in, in one instance um, in a hotel room in the American Colony Hotel in East, East, East Jerusalem. And, um, and it's partly for this reason, I think, these reasons that he's so intrigued by Primo Levi. Um, um, he, um, he, he goes to Israel and Palestine because for the same reason he writes in his diaries that he went to Prague a decade earlier. He wants to actually write something that, that doesn't center on himself, a place where other things happen, where people presumably don't think just about themselves, although the Prime Minister of Israel seems to do just that, and, uh -huh. um, and, uh -huh. um, and, uh, and where people are thinking about larger things. Um, and um, and, I, and he, he, he gravitates toward Primo Levi, not only because of his sustained preoccupation with the Holocaust, which is a preoccupation of his from the, from the very, his first 
moments as a writer. He's trying to write about Anne Frank already in the 1950s. He writes a play about um, um, Jacob Genz, um, the, the head of the Judenrat, um, a, a, a very controversial figure, the head of the Judenrat in mm -hmm. Vilna, already um, 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 soon after he writes, he publishes Goodbye Columbus um, in 1959. He's, he's, um, he's intensely preoccupied with the Holocaust, but he ends up gravitating toward Primo Levi in some measure out of the, the fantasy. And Primo Levi checks him in the conversation that's published in the Times, the fantasy that Primo Levi is the perfect person. He's a person who lives comfortably with family. He's going to presumably commit suicide uh, a few months later. Um, um, he's, he's someone who lives comfortably with his, uh, with his mother in his 90s, who it, it seems is driving him crazy. Yeah. Um, he lives comfortably with his wife. Uh, Roth is always dreaming about living comfortably with, with one woman, which he, he, he doesn't. I'm, uh, in, in late March, I'm flying to Stockholm to interview um, an 18 year, a woman who was involved in an 18-year-old affair with him who lived half a mile away uh, from him while he was living with Claire Bloom. Um, um, he, imagines, he, imagines Primo Le and he imagines Primo Levi as the, a person who's completely at, at, at peace with work. Work is something that intensely preoccupies Roth. The last word of Goodbye Columbus is work. Um, uh, he returns from Brenda Potemkin visiting her at Radcliffe. The relationship is over, and he returns. He returns to work. And Primo Levi is this person who presumably is a complete person. He worked in a paint factory um, uh, by day he, he, until his retirement. He wrote by night. He lives with his mother. He lives comfortably with his wife. He lives in an uh, a, apartment building uh, comparable to the large solid apartment buildings on the Upper West Side. He's. He's everything that Roth is not. Now, he's not. Um, um, and um, as, um, as Uri knows better than almost anyone. Um, but at the same time, that's, that's the Roth that comes to this interview. That's the Roth that meets uh, Primo Levi. I think one of the more um, interesting paragraphs uh, in Roth's um, introduction to the uh, interview is this, the Levi, Levi's large apartment is shared as it has been since the couple met and married after the war with Primo Levi's mother. She is 91. Levi's 95-year-old uh, mother-in-law lives not far away. In the apartment next door lives his 28-year-old son, a physicist, and a few streets farther um, on is his 38-year-old daughter, a botanist. I don't know of another contemporary who has voluntarily remained over so many decades intimately ent entangled um, um, and comfortably entangled. Now, Roth, apparently, Primo Levi is not comfortably entangled. Um, um, Roth is always entangled, um, but he dreams of the absence of entanglement uh, somewhere, uh, perhaps in Prague, Kafka's Prague, per perhaps in Appelfeld, Jerusalem, perhaps sitting side by side with Primo Levi. I'll finish the quote. Um, um, and in such direct and broken contact with his immediate family, his birthplace, his region, the world of his forebearers, and particularly the local working environment, which in Turin is the home of fiat, um, is uh, largely industrial. Of all the intellectually gifted artists of the 20th century, and, and Levy's, Levy's uniqueness is that he is more, than, uh, more the artist chemist than the chemist writer. He may well be the most thoroughly adapted to the totality of life around him. Perhaps in the case of Primo Levi, a life of communal inter interconnectedness, along with his masterpiece on Auschwitz, constitutes his profoundly spirited response to those who did all they could to sever his every sustained connection and tear him and his kind out of history. One, one final comment about this interview, uh, at least a co final comment for now. Um, he, um, Roth presses him at the beginning about his attitude toward work. Um, it, it's an amazing moment, and uh, and 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 makes a, a rather elaborate um, argument, a kind of an argument built out of filigree, if you will, um, about how what Levy's attitude toward work is the exact antidote of the of the reality of senseless work in Auschwitz, and how a uh, a woman he knew early on had said that Levy was involved in sublimation, and in fact was very uncomfortable with women. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why he threw himself into work. But Roth said, that's not accurate, is it? And Levy comes back to him and says, you know what? It is accurate. 
Um, what you're saying about Auschwitz, maybe, I mean, he's being polite, maybe it's right, but, but I was terrified of women. And, um, and that's why I threw myself into work. The um, Roth, in a way, is, despite his, his um, disdain for religion, is looking for a saint. Yeah. He's, he's searching for a saint and um, someone who has, you, is humanly integrated in the way in which he isn't and can't be. Um, he's looking for someone who's integrated in, the, in ways in which he denies in his fiction is, it's, it's conceivable to be integrated. Um, and, um, and he finds it in Levy, at least at this particular moment. So is any of that right? <laughs> you, you, see, you started by saying it's all about getting it wrong. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you must not conflate the biographer with the person he's, he or she is writing about. Oh, okay. Roth, Roth, Roth said that. I, oh. I just, just one, one other note about getting things wrong and, and learning how to stop. I, um, uh, um, Roth was very close with uh, Albert Goldman, who was uh, very influential, eventually rather excoriated rock critic. I mean, when he died, actually, in a, in a plane crash, he was the only person I know of, of any fame, who were obituaries actually wrote in leading newspapers, thank God he's dead. And, um, but, but um, uh, um, I, 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 he, 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 he produced a Boswellian-like conversations with Roth that are in his archive at Columbia that I learned about when I was, when I was, uh, when I was doing the preliminary research. And, um, and in them, he mentions this woman that he was involved with who also knew Roth. And so I tracked her down on the Upper West Side, had a conversation with her, walked up upstairs to my wife for my study, very proudly said that I had actually had this interview. And she said to me, she said, are you saying to me, not only are you going to actually interview every single woman who knew Roth, but you're going to interview every single woman who knew every friend of Roth's. <laughs> this book is never going to end. <laughs> and uh, I, I took that to heart. So, right. um, I think it's. I think you're describing. It, it's a great description of what goes on there. It. It certainly seems to be that Roth wishes to meet. Um, somebody who Levy isn't. It's very, he wants to see and work. For, so I have, there's, a million, just, there's a million things to say here. Just the subject of work was really important to Levy. And I think it was extremely important to Roth as well. And somehow there, uh, the gravitational pull of uh, Albert Machtfei is there in the air between them. Mm -hmm. Now I am, I am positive, there is no way he could know it. Roth didn't know that Levy's, Levy published, uh, 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 if this is a man or survival in Auschwitz, he, he published the first version in 1947, and then a second one, the one you know, if you know it, in 1958. But when he, and then he did, and 47 he published it and disappeared. Didn't write anything publicly. And he resurfaces first with a, with a piece about Remarque's novel on the camps, and his second piece is about that, is about Albach Machfei and the future of work in the world the Nazis were planning for us. And he, and he spends that time uh, uh, sort of describing the, the kind of cynicism that is in that, uh, in having that over the, and he says, it's of a humor that only the germ, that only Germans hold the key to. I think that's <laughs> precisely the, uh, but he doesn't exactly explain what's funny about it. You know what I mean? Um, and I think he kind of refuses Roth's point that there oh, is, that, yeah, uh, that there, you know what I mean? He's sort I, I, ever so gently, he's sort of telling him, no, yeah, Arbacht macht's frei, but not, yeah. not in the way you're thinking, uh, I feel. I also wanted to say about that, that that piece of discussion with Roth, when he says, no, no, we were, we were uh, I was very shy, and we were teased by our, you know, by, by right. during, so Levy was born in, in uh, 1919, so he is a, he grew up uh, uh, under fascism all his life, and, and with all, and there's a certain masculinity and whatnot that goes with it, something which Roth, which is very different in America, but also uh, uh, Roth dealt with. 
And, and he tells them they would tease us that, that because we were circumcised, we were uh, uh, sterilized. Right. And I swear, I've looked everywhere, it is the only time in all of Levy's career that he mentions his own uh, body part. Really? Seriously. Never, ever, the, not to be repeated. So le less frequently than Roth mentioned body parts? Uh, not only less, but he, I, 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 I think it's actually cute because he felt, he says, uh, uh, this is, uh, he says this to Roth. He doesn't, he only knew Roth from Portnoy's complaint. That's all he read in, that was all he read in Italian before they met. He hadn't read anything. Of the, which is amazing, but he had, was unfamiliar with that entire tradition. He knew just uh, just a little bit of what uh, uh, of what comes over here, and I feel like it's an homage. He fe I think he's feel he feels like it is an homage to Roth to speak about that, and and he gives them a, and he gives them like a rarity. You know what I mean? Something he had never talked about. Great. The, yeah. There's that moment in the interview where um, Primo Levi says to Roth, um, a, a good friend of mine has, said, has told me that whenever I speak about anything else in life, it's in black and white. And whenever I speak about my time in Auschwitz or the months afterwards, um, it's in technicolor. Mm -hmm. And um, it's my fate, I think he then goes on to say, that all of my adventures were during the war. And he seems to be implying that there's something um, more dismal than he'd like to admit about his subsequent life. Am I overreading? Um, dismal may not, not, not be the word, but you know, I mean, black and white movies are great, but Technicolor is different. Yeah. Uh, What's it, he saying there? <sighs> Well, I think he's saying something that, that uh, uh, it also pertains. He's saying something about the relationship between life and biography. And um, it's, there's a similarity here. This is like, a, this is very, you know, there's a similarity there because Roth has many times, many, many people were always in search of Roth inside his writing. And he resented that. I think part of the reason. He resented it to, to, to an extent. All of, all of his notes to his first, his second authorized biographer that I've, I now have access to, he writes and says, that scene is based on this, and that scene is based on that. So you can't even believe Roth when he ins is insisting that you must believe Roth, because even then you can't believe Roth. But he is a writer of fiction, so you don't look to a writer of fiction for, for the qualities of an historian. He's he he's he's making things up, mm -hmm. and so uh, no, there's there's so much that he draw he he, he um, it's the um, he draws the, what the atmospheric and his atmospheric presence from the details of his life, mm -hmm. um, and then um, he uses them as a springboard. Yeah. So it's not autobiography. He's absolutely right, but he is drawing from his life, which is absolutely right. So. So Levy is also doing something which is very similar. He has these really, these, these situations, these things he's seen, these things from the camp, from his life after, from that period, which become for him like these narrative figures that he keeps writing and rewriting in order to understand them better. Hmm. Uh, so he's sort of developed that, but he was hounded by the Italian uh, critics, by Italian literary scholars, by this notion that he was, that he was divided into, he was a testimony, a witness, and a writer. And he was an excellent witness, that's how they saw him, until the late 70s. An excellent witness who's written excellent testimony and a very mediocre writer. Oh, I see, that, so that, that kind of division. Yeah. That was the dichotomy that he was sort of struggling with as he was writing these books that are the ones that Roth reads when they meet, The Monkey Wrench, right. and uh, if, not, if Not Now, When, all of them not the strongest levy, so to speak. And the strongest levy is what? 
But you promised to answer the strongest Roth afterwards. Yeah, we, 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 didn't, we didn't make this wager <laughs> we did, before. We no. didn't, make, we didn't no. agree on that. You see, so, some, some academics like one another. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, so it is, it, it is, it is conceivable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have a view of that. What is the essential levy? And those books are not e in, the, in that. The essential levy is, uh, if this is a man, the tale of Auschwitz, uh, the truce with his, the time of his, uh, the time between Auschwitz and his return to Italy, which are 10 months, which is, which is just a great book. It's just uh, an excellent book. Uh, the Periodic Table, which is a masterpiece of uh, having sort of been elaborated the experience and, and, and things like that. And, and then I believe it's a collection of stories which is called Lilith and Other Stories, which here was translated in pieces. Now everything, it's, it's in, the, uh, in, the, in the edition, but here it was, it was translated in pieces, in different pieces, et cetera, before that. But it's considered usually just a sort of a bucket where Levy throws all he had in 1981. But I, I am striving to show that this is where he reaches artistic completion. And, and then that The Drowned in the Save is, 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 a, is, a, is an interesting book, but it's not essential. So uh, the, it's Levy reflecting on his uh, The on critics his literature. who, who, who s s scored him for being more a chronicler than a writer, were they in some measure right? I don't, that's a, that's a really, that, that's a really excellent question. I think they were not. I think they tortured him for nothing. It was a way of belittle, belittling the literary achievement that he had achieved and what he had done. It was a way to sort of put it in its place. Okay, this is, remember, in 1947, he published his book in like a really small publishing house. Mm -hmm. uh, the big publishing house said the Italians didn't want to hear about this. Right. And this was said to him by somebody like Natalia Ginsburg, who, was, mm -hmm. uh, who knew the material. Right. Uh, so I feel that was, that was a way to torment him more than anything else and sort of to keep Italian letters, you know what I mean, clean? Of that, like that's not part of literature. That's part of testimony. That's part of history, but it's not uh, uh, part of literature. And then that goes back to these unfinished, all of that unfinished business with fascism, because yeah. Levy wrote about his wrote about he didn't he wrote about fascism, but he never never uh, uh, came to. Right, yeah. that way it came to terms to, to that. I mean, Roth from the beginning is either massively loved or massively hated. Uh, there's very little neutral reaction to Roth from, from the outset for, for reasons we can talk about later if you want. And, um, and, and that uh, remains true even when that body in Stockholm, it seems to me, searches every village in Romania for a poet to give the Nobel Prize to so that they don't have to give it to Roth. <laughs> and that goes on for several years of a kind of con concerted Scandinavian sadism. And um, so, uh, you know, when, when, when we can debate that if we want. And um, so... Um, but re really, you, you think they, it was like on the table and every... every then it, they it go, was, it, I, I know. It was so they go to find Emer Kertisch in order not to give it to Roth. Well, and, you know, and, and Dylan, who, you know, I have gr my far greater respect for than Roth did when he, his response, of course, was, well, next year they'll give it to Peter, Paul, and Mary. But, um, uh, but, uh, and that's, and that, and he's, he's enormously preoccupied with winning Nobel. I mean, it's, it's, um, in the end, you know, he, 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 uh, he has, he's, he's, he's both a, a generous man and not. It, it, so, so much of his fiction is about doubles, not only because of the influence of Gogol and others, but so much from the very outset, uh, Eli the Fanatic is about a double. Portnoy's complaint is about a double. And um, there's the nice boy, the nice Jewish boy who works for Lindsay, and then there's the other boy that one, 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 one talks about. 
And um, there's, of course, the Operation Shylock is, is explicitly about, about uh, d doubles. But he's, he's subtle enough, say, in the Operation Shylock, he, which is uh, built around a kind of semi-maniac who's calling for, uh, who's, who's issued a diasporic um, declaration calling for Jews, Ashkenazic Jews, Jews of European descent, to leave Israel. Um, uh, before uh, Israel is overwhelmed by its enemies, uh, Sephardic Jews can stay, according to him. And Roth is playing with his own preoccupation with America being the, 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 the golden land. And so to some extent, he's been a dios diasporist for years. And so he makes himself, uh, he exaggerates what he's saying to the point of, 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 of mania. And... Um, and he, uh, uh, and, but all, all, almost all of his books, starting with Goodbye Columbus, by and large, the reviews are, are stellar. And then uh, there's actually the review in the Partisan Review, uh, which, where he's actually called, well, this is a term that we know from the, from the State of the Union, he's called a liar. And, you know, I mean, he is a novelist. I mean, no, yeah, no, sure. novelist lie. And um, so the, the reactions are, are, are starkly um, oppositional from, from the, the very outset. And, but very quickly, he comes to occupy a kind of center stage and, um, and is um, admired for that and resented. And he, um, he never or rarely, I mean, though he's seen as a repetitive writer, if you really think about it, rarely does he write the same book twice. And uh, he, you know, he moves from, um, uh, from Goodbye Columbus to, um, to uh, which is built these tight Chekho Chekhovian-like stories to Letting, letting Go, uh, this massive rambling novel. He'll, he'll write his baseball novel. He'll, he'll write The Breast, a, a Kafka-like thing. He's constantly actually, he's experimenting with himself. He's also acutely attuned to critics and, um, and to what critics are saying about him and reshapes himself accordingly and is an assiduous reader. I mean, I don't know of any leading American novelist who builds, builds books as almost protagonists into his, his work. And he's deeply skeptical of, write, of, of reading. He's skeptical of the way in which it separates you from life. And so there's this constant interplay between him and his double, um, um, really um, to, to, to the end. And, um, and, and he, he, meets, he meets Primo Levi at a moment of a particular anguish, where he's looking for someone who's integrated at all. And, um, I, I want to I read you from The, the Ghost Writer because I agree that it is just a fantastic book, which is sort of just such a pleasure to go to Roth, read. Roth, Roth's reaction to the praise of the, of the Ghost Writer was, it comes down too easily. I think he was, he was, he was talking about it comparable to, to Chinese food. And, and so they don't like my more complicated books. They like the more lyrical books. It, it's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I... When should we, how much, well, because no, tell, tell us when to stop. We, yeah, we could talk all day. Like, yeah, and we could listen all day, but I think that 10 more minutes and then we'll open yeah. it to questions. Okay, five to 10 minutes and then we'll... we'll yeah, we'll, we'll, okay, so yeah. We'll, we'll get to the question. We'll, so we'll get, we'll move from here to the question, uh, who need, if Levy needs a biography, Roth needs and why, so we can, so we, yeah, we sort of have an, an arc, but I still want, want to read this. This is in, in Ghost Writer, this is the young writer, Nathan uh, Zuckerman, goes to meet his uh, idol, E.I. Uh, Lonoff, which we were discussing before, ends up or is Roth. Or as he sees himself here. Here is 79, he's what? He's 50. He's in something. his 40s. Now. Yeah, he's still. But, uh, yeah. And he says, This is, it's a, uh, it's a great book. And this, I realized, is, he tells him how to operate the, the, the record, record machine, the record player, which is just exquisite. This is the volume, of course. This is the start button. This is the reject. You push it. <laughs> And this, I realized, is the excruciating scrupulosity, the same maddening, meticulous attention to every last detail that makes you great. 
that keeps you going and got you through and now is dragging you down. Standing with E. Ilonov over the disobedient arm of the record player, I understood the celebrated phenomena for the first time. A man, his destiny, and his work. All one. What a terrible triumph. <laughs> Let, let's just end with, with my favorite quote from the ghostwriter. Let me try to find it. Um, and and here, here Roth is describing himself. I remember uh, I, I met him in the last few years of his life. And we talked often. And he, uh, I remember sitting in his apartment on West 79th Street, down the street from Central Park. And he said, one of the most beautiful parks in the world is just down the street. I can't, I can't go there in the daytime because I would feel to be wasted hours. And so, um, and, uh, and I mean, he, he, he'd already written 31 books. And um, you would think Gnug. Um, so um, but let, me, uh, uh, let me just find. I think this. That, that really explains that's what he saw, you know, in Levy. He, he thought he saw that in Levy. And yeah, then a right. year later, uh, Levy dies. He's found right at the bottom of his, the stairwell in his home. And the question is, did he commit suicide or not? And for Roth, it was really important at this point to determine that Levy had committed suicide. Uh, and some speculate, not everybody, some speculate that this is like the, the passage Levy re read, that this is part of his crisis of not being able to know that having, it was important to him to have gotten R Levy wrong in that way, mm -hmm. I think, though yeah. I don't know exactly how to explain it. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe you can wrap this up with it, 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 this part of the discussion in, in, in that sense of, for me, uh, uh, the importance of writing about Levy is not so much to explain his work through his life, because that's what he does anyway, but to explain the, the relevance of his work to others outside those that immediately get it. That's, that's like my kind of objective, and I'm wondering in the same terms how you feel about that, what Roth is... Uh, uh, well, he, I mean, he was, he was generous. Um, to people that he felt were people of extraordinary talent. And that whole Penguin series of these Central European writers really gave, I mean, he, he introduced Bruno Schultz to the world. Yeah. Otherwise, he'd be unknown. And so he did, he did feel, he, did, he was able to exhibit extraordinary generosity um, um, in that respect and in other respects. Um, meanwhile, he was saying to me, I turn sentences around, that's my life. I write a sentence, and then I turn it around. Then I look at it, and I turn it around again. Then I have lunch. Then I come back in, and I write another sentence. Then I have tea, and I turn the new sentence around. Then I read the two sentences over and turn them both around. Then I lie down on my sofa, and I think. Then I get up, and I throw, throw, out, throw, throw them out and start from the beginning. And if I knock off from this routine for as long as a day, I'm frantic with boredom and a sense of waste. On Sundays, I breakfast late and read the newspapers with hope, his wife. Then we go for a walk in the hills, and I'm haunted by the loss of all their good time. I wake up Sunday mornings, and I'm nearly crazy at the prospect of those unusable hours. I'm restless, I'm bad-tempered, but she's a human being too, you see. And so I go. To avoid trouble, she makes me leave my watch at home. The result is that I look at my wrist instead. We're walking, she's talking, then I look at my wrist, and that generally does it. If my foul mood hasn't already, she throws in the sponge, we go home. And at home, what is there to distinguish Sunday from Thursday? I sit back at my little Olivetti, and uh, that was Roth's um, a typewriter, and start looking at sentences and turning them around. And I ask myself, why is there no way but this for me to fill my hours? Why don't we end there and, and begin talking, OK? I, I copied, I have part of that copy that I live in fantasy. And he says, there, there, over there, I turn this phrase around and I live in fantasy. Lono said. Were you speaking about yourself? No, no, I'm saying about Lono. I was talking about, you, about yourself. Uh -huh, also. <laughs> <laughs> we always are. So I want to do something that we sometimes do in conferences, and that's to collect a few questions. Sometimes it means that we will have more questions than answers. But um, it's interesting, would be interesting for you to see what people are, would like to know, and then you could decide what to answer and how.
Okay. So let's do like three questions at a time. Okay. Since you all have questions, then um, I'll just wait for the first one. To... Yeah. So what do you think inspired each of your fascinations with these individuals? What kind of drew you there? And then what distinguished these individuals from any other person that you picked to write about or read about? So, um, Roth has been the writer who, who's really been in my mind um, always since I was 17. Um, it was his books I'd buy in, paper, in hardcover when I was a graduate student, and you know how much money graduate students have. Um, Roth represented, Roth depicted for me, uh, for, first in, in Portnoy's Complaint, which I read, the first book of his. Um, both the prospect of freedom and the underbelly of freedom. Because Portnoy is not a hero, he's a tortured man. And, uh, and Roth intends for you to understand that. And, um, and so um, coming out of what I came out from, an, a, a, a very erudite fundamentalist Jewish background, but built around deductive thinking, where there were pre-existing conclusions, and then you 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 actually somehow reconciled every, everything with regard to those conclusions. Um, Roth's notion of freedom uh, remained with me, and um, and especially at a cultural moment like the one that we're living through, where the word freedom increasingly is the slogan of the cultural and political right, it seemed all the more important to revisit Roth for me. And um, and then I I was I was given the opportunity right editing a major book biography series and approaching Roth and mine was to be the other biography and um, he had, he had talked to me years before about writing the authorized biography soon after I wrote Rosenfeld's Lives and he contacted me about doing that but he he was speaking to a number of people at the time and uh, I didn't like the idea of an authorized biography but. Um, but then I had the opportunity to write about a writer whose voice had always been in my head, and um, and the opportunity became all the more um, uh, pressing when uh, what happened to Blake Bailey's book happened to Blake Bailey's book, and I I had access to all this archival material, and um, and he he also put me in touch with the people closest to him, who had huge amounts of of material in their homes. And so I spent time in their homes um, copying material. So um, it seemed only in this way could I get beyond the artifice and, and to write a book that, the sort of book that a literary biography should be and that Blake, Blake Bailey's by and large was not. And that is to actually write about the interplay between the messiness of life and, and, and art um, um, sometimes truly really brilliant art, and um, so, and he, he, I, I've never tired now. Though I've been working on this for four years, and I do get tired, but, but I've never tired of reading him, and uh, both as a fiction writer and also he's an extraordinary nonfiction writer. So those are some of of the reasons why opportunity, um, uh, lifelong admiration. And love for his work, and um, and then the the dramatic, astonishing implosion of of a 900-page book about him that really just exists um, um, somewhere in the netherworld, along but published by a publisher who mostly publishes books, um, uh, Trumpian books. So it um, it just it, th those were some of the reasons. Uh, I, uh, yeah, my, uh, it's way more existential with me. I started at 17, it's a, it's, it's a strange story. At 17, I rate, it came, here's the thing. Roth enabled Primo Levi in Israel as well. It goes that far. Once that interview is published, published well, a lot of other things happen, but he gets published. He gets his, that's the, he gets the certificate, even in Israel. Unbelievably, it was the book was not Primo Levi's book was not published until 1987, hmm. which is just uh, because there's a good reason for that because it goes against the grain of a certain way of seeing 
things in Israel, those things especially. Uh, and when it was published, I read it and it immediately drew my, yeah, I, I, and, but there was something off with the translation and I didn't know what. And I said, well, I got to see this in the original. So I learned Italian. And like my, I mean it. That's I, I was 17. That's what you can do when you're 17. Oh, okay, I'll go to Italy. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> according, according to according to Roth, there's other things that boys do at 17. Yeah, sure, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> that's what I did. So I so it like changed. It shifted all my whole life changed because like a bunch of other stuff happened, which like kept me in Italy and like made a, a whole. But I, what I learned later was that, uh, that I was right. <laughs> Insofar that the translation was trying really hard to translate Levy's not only language, but conceptual language into the way things, into the way things were seen in Israel since the Eichmann trial, more or less. And it's fascinating. So he'll translate uh, the grays, like literally, Levy says the days were, uh, were, were in front of me, uh, inarticulate, gray and inarticulate, and it'll be translated into Hebrew, tough and hot, black and tough as uh, chalamish, mm. which is like, you know what I mean? Like really biblical, sort of giving it a lot of gravity. Um, so that's what drew me to it initially, and then I sort of realized that there is a key there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just take it, you know, as big as I ever see it. It's, it wavers, huh? But as big as I can see it, there is an essential message for humanity, for the continuation of the world, and what Levy has to say. And he has done... The, he, he is one of those of the maximum, he has that degree of listening, which is writing so others can hear. Mm -hmm. Something which is really hard to understand because if you think about it, it's the ultimate translational uh, conundrum because we're using the same words to describe something, but they don't. Levy says this a million times. We're, we're, I'm, I'm saying hunger. But you do not, you cannot understand what I mean by hunger. It's not the hunger you know as hunger, knowing it's a different kind of, but we'll use the same word. And that goes for almost everything. And he has managed to find some way through that, which is just holds a key to, you know what I mean? It's like, what's going to happen to surplus humanity? It's like, uh, you know what I mean? And I, we're getting near. It's not as far as, it's like, yeah. So that's how I feel. I might be wrong. Maybe we all feel that what we do is like crucial for the future of the world. But like I, I honestly believe that it does, that it matters, that it, and, and it depends on us to, to find a way for, to mediate uh, uh, that. You, you, you have to, if you're going to really write, and I feel this regarding dissertations and all sorts of things that one writes, there has to be an interplay between heart and mind. You, you have to, and it seems to me utility in the humanities stinks from the head like a fish. That you don't start with utility, you start with that interplay. And, um, and you have to always be aware, there's no such thing as something being objectively more important. You can't be told that. And um, it has to be something that's more important to you as both of us have described, um, each in our own way. And, um, and um, you, need, you, can't, you can't search for that indefinitely. You, it seems to me you must search for that and write consequently with, with con consequent clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna collect a few questions. So first Amir and then at the back. So, Steve, thank you for really phenomenal uh, conversation and opening up, you know, uh, not just the life and work of two magnificent writers, but the process of you know, writing, thinking about them. And listening to the way you responded to the first question, I had to think to myself that there's also a, a great tension between these two. I mean, uh, Roth is, of course, 
focused in a phenomenal manner uh, on the um, both sides of freedom. Freedom makes possible and the ways in which you know, our freedom of our bodies and our minds you know, drives us ever so often uh, into the abyss. Um, and Levy deals with the ways in which you know, taking away you know, freedom from portions of humanity, uh, incarcerating, murdering, etc., cetera, uh, entire people in looks like you know, in the modern era. What does it mean for all of us in an ethical, almost theological manner? So in a way, there, I mean, one is busy with the I, and the other is busy with, with the we. Um, so I'm really interested and puzzled about your thoughts regarding this tension. In other words, you know, uh, many young students sitting here, and some of us are engaged in teaching younger people, you know, literature, history, and so on. So when you hand a student a Primo Levi book, it's kind of clear to me, I know what, the message, you know, which comes along with the book. With Roth, it's much more difficult, much more complicated. Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on, you put your finger on one of the most abiding central preoccupations of Roth's. He, um, almost from the outset, uh, actually starting in Goodbye Columbus, the novella, he is preoccupied with what it means, he's, he's preoccupied with what it means to actually, to what extent one expends too much of oneself in involvement with other people. If you reread Goodbye Columbus, what, what most, um, what he comes to doubt most about Brenda Potemkin, and I, I've gotten to know the woman who is the model for Brenda Potemkin. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just allowed myself that boast for a moment. Um, um, and um, it's the extent to which she'll enslave him. Um, in other words, in, the enslavement of oneself as a result of engagement with others is, is his abiding preoccupation. And, um, and, um, and though he's known um, as an author who's preoccupied with sex, in fact, there's very few sexually explicit scenes in any of his work. Um, he is, I think, rather uh, a, a writer who is enormously preoccupied well, someone like Genet, with, with childhood. And with what one loses after the idyll of childhood with all the obsessions of adult life, perhaps preeminently sexual obsessions, which connect you, but then don't necessarily connect you. All of his, his first, first full length novel, Letting Go, is all about the cost of being involved with other people. And um, he, he's constantly returning to this theme. And, um, and then is drawn to involvement. He starts that Penguin series. He writes several of the introductions. He's introdu introducing to the world all these East Central European writers, some of whom are, are, are unknown. It's an enormous project. He basically starts his own publishing house. Um, um, he's both enormously generous and, and not. And, um, and a lot of that interplay between what it means to actually be me um, and, um, and the cost of being me. I mean, think about um, Coleman Silk in The Human Stain. Um, he, he wants to be himself. And what it means is cutting himself off from his family. He's born black. He, 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 um, he, he, he um, comes to be known as a Jewish-born classicist. Um, and, um, and then his entire life is ruined. This black man, this sequestered black man, African American, his entire life is ruined because he is in class, he is in a classic class, and two students have never been in class, in the class, and he asks, um, who are they? Are they spooks? Now, the first dictionary definition of a spook is an apparition, a ghost, and he's very precise with his language. The second subsidiary definition is that it's a slang word and a slur, slur, slur word for an African American.
He's saying, are they ghosts? He's a sequestered black man. He's fired, or he, 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 uh, he leaves his, his job, his lifelong job in a college where he's been his entire life is excoriated as a racist, even though he's an African American, and he wants to be me, and his insistence on being me destroys his life. Um, and that's where Roth's genius is, I think, not dissimilar from Dostoevsky. He gives often the best arguments to um, um, sides that he disagrees with. And um, um, Coleman Silk is doing everything that Roth wanted to do, and it destroys him. And um, he's not a polemicist. Um, um, he's in some way an anti-polemicist. And, um, and so the, what you identify, that tension between what's at the heart of Primo Levi and Roth, is very accurate. And it's a tension that, that, that drives his, his fiction, and to some extent drives him nuts. Because it's, it's unresolved and unresolvable. He, he has deep connections to people. And at the same time, he wants to be greater than Melville, um, never, never Kafka, greater than Joyce. And if you want to be greater than Joyce, you've got to spend a lot of, there's not a lot of discretionary time for other human beings. And, uh, and I think that's one of his main, main preoccupations. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to say something, but uh, we can take more questions, and, uh, and I'll try to integrate that. I'll, I'll just say that. I'm not that following your pattern, am I? I'm uh, take, we're supposed to take a okay. cluster. It's a, yeah. It's okay. yeah, I'm, 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 I'm representing a person who's always in dispute, and consequently, I'm just not going to follow the, your rules. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'll say this. I think Levy is sometimes too well understood. That's, uh, that's an illusion. Uh, of his, uh, and that's sort of my con, you know, the, my conflict with bi bi the biographism in Levy serves to even make it clearer, and I think uh, it, that that work thrives in the grays. Uh, Levy has a way of seeing things and writing them as poetic. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Aristotle's primary definition. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. He's, but he's also highly inventive in uh, speculative stories, etc. He does that. But it, I, that, did, that enters into the essential only through the, the collection of stories. But he wrote a lot of speculative fiction. So he's not incapable, but he just, it just uh, integrating them is a nightmare. Because they can be integrated, but it's a nightmare for the reader and, and the writer. Maria, what, did you, what did you see in him at 17? that basically transformed your life? I think I saw that gray zone where, where we had black and white. I think that's what that was in. A little bit more of what? Uh, that where, that, that opening into the universality of it, instead it's not like Jews here are, are it's Jewish and it's German, but it's also human. I, I think that was what was, was really important to me at that moment, as I was before the army and stuff like that. So I was thinking about it seriously. What is it I'm doing? What is it I'm going to do? And, and where it stands. And I think that that is really what drew me sort of very subconsciously, because I, I didn't know. But, I, but it had that. It, it was different from anything else I've read on the subject. And I've read a lot at that point. I was interested. And as an Israeli, I mean, I, I described how Roth for me was the fundamental counterweight to the prospect of going off to Chicago Yeshiva. Yeah. Um, Roth, as an, you reading him as an Israeli, was a counterweight also to something. To going to the army. And, to, and how so? <sighs> Which probably, a... was, probably was more pleasant than going to Chicago Yeshiva. <laughs> 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 that is a theory that can't be tested now. <laughs> uh, more so, I, I, uh, this good thing this is recorded. I, uh, I, I've been thinking about that for a while. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember citing that document, but I know I did. But go on. I, there was, the, it was the first intifada, and that was a real question to me. You know what I mean? My, that was the time when Robin said soldiers. What, what it meant to be a soldier you was to, to go bones. and break, break, bones. Bones, break bones. And that to me was like, I did not grow up with that sense of justice at all. My, 
from one side, my, my grandparents are from Germany. It was right. all really clear. Everything was clear to me. And, and, but then, like, it's, then it started, and it really, and, and it really complicated uh, the picture. And I think I was looking for both, right? For, both for a chizuk, for something that would, you know, prove the paradigm. But then I found something that was, uh, went even deeper, and I think that really, really drew me really drew me and sustained, sustained me even through, yeah. I was in the army for five years. And I was waiting to get out and go to Italy and study Italian. Uh, they, they kept you in for five? Well, I, you, you, they kept you, me, you were yeah. trained as a Mossad agent? I was, I, uh, I was a naval officer, so I wouldn't have to do it. Uh, so, so I was in, in the, at sea, so it was, but it was a longer time. Wow. But that, but that uh, certainly sustained me inside for, yeah. I was reading. I was. I was reading like I was a free man. Uh, mm. I, yeah, but you, you're not yeah. exactly. I think there was a question there. A question at the back. Thank you. Um, I've always been puzzled by Roth's protest against being designated a Jewish writer. He would say, "I grew up an American. Right. I read American right. literature. I write American English." He was so vehement in his rejection of that designation. How do we explain that, given that he wrote so many books about Jewish characters? And, and also, was there something, was there a similar ambivalence in Primo Levi? So, was... Yeah, I mean, one, one definition of an American Jewish writer is someone who denies that they're an American Jewish writer. <laughs> so they all did. And so somehow your Dora Welty is, is a world writer, even though she writes about the South or Faulkner. And, uh, but an American, being called an American Jewish writer basically means that you write like, like Leon Uris or Herman Woke. And so um, Roth becomes more comfortable over time. And um, he, um, he gives an interview um, somewhere, I think he's in his 60s, and he, he says that um, um, the only writers, the only readers that I really recognize are Jews. He said, he said writing, writing, writing for, for Jews is like um, uh, being part of a kind of small country where um, what you write actually counts. And I have about 50,000 readers who read me carefully and all of them are Jews. And um, he, um, uh, so it's a trope. Saul Bellow says the same thing. Bernard Malibud says the same thing. It's really not to be taken as shots. It's not to be taken literally. And, um, and it's a tick. And um, I mean, some, some critics have taken those declamations seriously. Uh, I, I don't at, 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 at all. And, um, and in many ways, um, I tested this on him and didn't get much of a response. But in many ways, his relationship to Jewishness, which is deep, um, is, is um, captured in, 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 a, in, in a short story of a writer he deeply admires and about whom he talks about in The Ghost Writer, that's Isaac Bobble. So Isaac Bobble um, um, does a cycle of Odessa stories. Um, um, uh, sort of uh, late in his writing career, he's, he, 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 he dies He's, he's killed in 41, I think, um, but he, uh, he, he stops, uh, he's pretty much um, silent from the mid-30s. He just doesn't fit into the Soviet literary world. And, uh, but in any event, uh, in the story of The Awakening, it's a story about a boy whose father wants him to be a great violinist because there's so many great violinists. In Odessa, he has no talent. He hangs out at the water. Um, and uh, the family is sitting around uh, at tea or, or dinner talking about how much money violinists, great violinists makes. And then he looks out the window, and Mr. Zagorski, his violin teacher, is walking down the street. Okay, he, he comes and he tells the, the family, the father uh, who's in charge of the family, that uh, the boy has him going to, to, um, to violin lessons. And the boy locks himself in the only place in a house where you could have a semblance of privacy, the bathroom. Crucial 
to Roth, the bathroom. And, um, and um, a, a little while later, the whole family is at the door of the bathroom. Um, the father tries to break down the, the door. There's one little um, um, lock that's holding the, the door secure. Uh, the boy waits there until nighttime. I'm going to get to the crucial Rothian moment in a moment. His aunt comes and walks him down the street to take him to her house to sleep that night because it's not safe at his house. And they're walking down the street. And Bobble, Bobble, Bobble has the young boy say, um, I, I held on to her hand. I thought of running away. I didn't. All of Roth's work is about that moment. You're thinking of running away. You're running away from attachment. You're running away from um, the woman that you happen to be with at the moment. You're running away from the Jews. But you never do. And time and again, he explores that moment. You know, I think many, many great artists, uh, I think this is largely true of Dylan, is true of, of Van Morrison and other musicians. You, um, there's this, this one um, uh, 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 mum, how do you translate mum into English? Um, this one wound, this one wound that you circle around. And the fundamental difference between a neurotic and an artist is what he or she does with it. And, um, and that was his fundamental wound. And, and he, he turned it into um, uh, novelistic gold, as often as not. So. so maybe we will end with that. Mm. And um, our class will stay for two seconds. But first, let's um, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.